Gary Seidlinger from Lincoln County Television, and I'd like to invite you April 27th through May 1st at 8 o'clock each night on LCTV as we celebrate Lincoln Health Week. Join Ms. Marvin Nesbitt as she interviews the leadership at Lincoln Health as well as the people at the Miles Campus that make this hospital such a vital part of our community. Welcome to our week-long celebration of Lincoln Health and the important role they play in our community. Lincoln County Television is proud to be doing this series. Um, tonight's shows will focus on leadership, the important role that leadership plays in implementing a health care system. The uh, first show will be an, uh, an interview I did some time ago. I had the privilege of sitting down with William Karen who is the CEO of the entire Maine Health System, uh, where we talked about the unification process where a number of hospitals in uh, our state were brought together under the umbrella of Maine Health. Um, so following the interview with uh, Mr. Karen, we'll have a, uh, a repeat of an interview I did with Jim Donovan, the president of, the Lincoln, of Lincoln Health. We did that recently, and our focus was on the effect that the COVID-19 virus has had on our community. So please enjoy the evening. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Marvin Nesbitt and this is Community Conversations. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome um, Bill Karen, uh, the CEO of Maine Health. Thank you, Bill, so much for You're coming. welcome, Marvin. This is a, a special um, uh, event <coughs> for us. We have the opportunity to learn about all that's going on with unification and the main health system from the person in charge. So I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, healthcare is a topic at the top of the pile these days. Bill, I certainly don't envy your, uh, your job. Uh, we're potentially on the edge of um, additional loss to uh, the Affordable Care Act, which will leave lots more people uninsured. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be anything on the horizon to replace that. If you could just offer some of your thoughts on the general state of health care um, in our country and some of the challenges that you face as a health care provider. Yeah, and I, I would agree, Marva, that um, health care is something that's very important to all of us and everybody in our country. And uh, we haven't quite figured it out yet as a, as a country. Um, you're right, the Affordable Care Act is, is, is under pressure. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was all about increasing access nationally to, to folks that need health care. Um, and we have, an, uh, we have an affordability crisis here in this country in that uh, health care, although, although we all need it and although we have a great system nationally and locally, it's an expensive need for all of us. And we need to sort through how we're going to make that health care accessible to everybody across the country. That's what the Affordable Care Act was about. Unfortunately, accessibility and a lot about health care gets caught up in some of the politics in the country, and so we're going to have ups and downs, but it is something that's so important that we're going to have to figure it out as a country. Yeah, uh, for certain. <coughs> uh, <coughs> health care is critical. Well, we, in fact, here in the state of Maine, um, have been in the midst for the last few years in a unification process. Uh, this unification concept has been all over the country. Uh, there have been... Um, large uh, unification efforts throughout the United States. Talk a little bit about what unification will mean to us, what's been going on with it, and what the long -term, some of the long-term goals are. Great. Um, our, our unification discussions really start with issues that are facing us in rural health care in the state of Maine. So um, I can describe the state of Maine, but, uh, but it's the same thing nationally in any rural setting. And so if you, if you look at rural health care in Maine, it is really hard to provide great health care in rural Maine and make it affordable and make it accessible. And so as, as we looked around our health system, and as you know, we serve the 11 southernmost counties in Maine and Carroll County, New Hampshire, but as we looked around our region, 
when we get into our smaller communities, we saw that there's, there's, there are continued threats to health care or to providing health care within those communities. If you're in a small community, the things that you have going against you when trying to provide great health care is that you have a higher burden of disease than we do in urban areas. We have older populations. Mm -hmm. Those older populations lead to more people under the Medicare program. And we have um, a, a, an economy that is not as strong. That lack of a strong economy leads to more people being on the Medicaid program. If you look at the two governmental payers, those are the two payers that comprise most of the, the business or most of the volume or activity that we have in our rural hospitals. And those two governmental payers do not reimburse community hospitals for their cost. Mm -hmm. So the Medicare program is reimbursing the, uh, a rural community about 90% of its cost. And the Medicaid program, those, those folks that can't afford health care or on a, on a state program, um, they're reimbursing, reimbursing rural hospitals at about 70% of cost. Wow. It's, it's that cost that, or that lack of full payment on, by governmental payers that causes us to have to cost shift the cost of health care to those that uh, have commercial insurance, et cetera. And that's significant in a, in a small community, a rural community, in that there aren't many commercial payers in those communities. It's not unusual. In fact, Lincoln, Lincoln Health probably has the highest governmental payer mix that we have in our system and that's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all patients who walk through the doors wow. are governmentally paid for and they're paid for at lower than cost. The challenge that gives us in, in Lincoln Health or in any rural community is we then need to recoup those additional costs from those few payers that can afford to pay it. The other thing of significance happening in rural health care is technology driven. We are, uh, the way we are providing health care is changing and it's changing rapidly. Um, we, we built a lot of hospitals in rural settings and we had a lot of inpatient activity over the years. But things are changing. Uh, the, the amount of activity that we have on an inpatient basis is, is declining and that's great because it's allowing us to provide care in ambulatory settings, more convenient settings, and we don't have to hospitalize patients. The problem is that uh, well, then, then the more complicated care has to be concentrated at the larger facilities. And so the challenge that gives us is declining volumes in the inpatient side of all of our rural hospitals. It's those decline, that's, that's where hospitals paid for all of the care it provided. It's, it was on the inpatient side. And so we're in the middle of a, a huge transformation from providing care in an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting and it turns our financial models upside down. It makes it harder and harder for a community hospital to generate an operating margin. And we do need to generate small operating margins if we're going to replenish the capital that we have in our rural hospitals to, to continue to grow those rural hospitals. And so that's the challenge that we have and the, the disconnect. Yeah. As a proud <coughs> trustee of uh, Lincoln Health, we discuss these very topics yep. um, every month. Uh, and of course, we here in Lincoln County are the chronologically the oldest population in the state. Right. So that's what contributes to this uh, to this mix. So, um, so how is um, unification um, a, a plus? You know, we yep. we we love our local hospital. Uh, Many of us who retired to this area, rather than growing up here, chose this community because it had a hospital, and um, uh, and very well regarded. I mean, we're awfully proud. Seven Leapfrog Awards, and yeah. you know, we're uh, we're really a fine rural hospital, um, and it's our own. Uh, so people feel, I think, some apprehension. We saw it in the unification meetings that we held around the county yes. yep. when unification was underway of just what it will mean for service at our local hospital. Um, how, does, how will unification here uh, in Maine uh, affect the small rural hospital? So unification, the process that we went through to look at centralizing our governance model and our financial models is really about protecting access to care in our rural communities. And so uh, I'll tell you what that means. Uh, what that means is that when we look at our rural communities' abilities today to make money, have an operating margin in the long term, 
it's it's a challenge, and mm -hmm. we're not sure that the, the, our rural hospitals are going to be able to do that. And so if you look at a system like ours, and you have rural communities, small hospitals who are making uh, a 1% margin or, a, or not having a margin, having a loss, when you know that you need a 3% operating margin long term to keep an organization viable, the question becomes, well, how are you going to fund that? Mm -hmm. In the past, our structure, our system for the first 20 years was built on what we call a decentralized shared governance model where we had local boards and a parent company board. But more importantly, we had separate income statements, separate balance sheets for each of our organizations. Each organization floated on its own boat, financial boat. What unification says is, no, we're going to take all of the resources of our system and we're going to put them together in one boat. And what that means is that we can look to a community that has a very difficult payer mix, has a very difficult economic uh, situation, uh, has a lot of bad debt and free care happening there, and we can say to that community, you don't need to generate a 3% operating margin. To break even or to make a 1% margin is the best we can do in this area if we're going to keep care close to home, which is our goal. And, and if you think about it from a system perspective, when you put everything in one big pot, that then says to the larger organizations like Maine Medical Center, where technology is concentrating the, the more profitable um, uh, tertiary kinds of cases, you need to make more than a 3% margin. So that when we add it all together, we've got 3% as a system, but what we're really doing is saying as a system, through unification, we'll, we will take the resources that we need, the 3% margin, we'll get there as a system and we'll allocate those resources out to the rural communities in order to keep the care close to home, which is our overall objective. I think <coughs> people don't realize, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, but this has been almost a trickle. Uh, this unification really started <coughs> years ago when we began to centralize billing and other administrative sort of processes, which people weren't aware of. But um, so this has been underway for some period of time. Aren't I correct in that? And this is really this last step of putting us all under this one umbrella in a common pot. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great observation. Uh, over the, we've built our system over the last 20 years. We mm -hmm. started our system in 1998. And um, as, you, as you indicated, what we did over that 20 years is we slowly uh, grew towards what we called systemness. I'm not sure that's a word. Yeah, but we, we said, I understand you know, what it means. <laughs> we're becoming more and more like a system. And what we did was we started with the operating side. And so we looked at clinical uh, services and more importantly administrative support services. And we said if we're going to become more efficient in providing that those services, we need to centralize, we need to consolidate uh, those kinds of services. And so we've done that. Uh, you know, for a number of years, we've had a single information technology department, a single finance department, a mm -hmm. single HR department. And we do that because we need to create economies, of s economies uh, and savings there that we can take and apply to the um, clinical side, which is where we really need additional resources. And so for 20 years, we, we evolved our, our operating model. Uh, what we had not done was we had not touched our governance model as I indicated, it was a decentralized shared governance model, and we hadn't uh, adjusted our financial model. Everybody was separate. Yeah. And so we believe that that was the next logical step that we need to make as a health system in order to really put it all together. Yeah. Well, clearly, financially, it's a plus <coughs> for a number of hospitals in our system. We're lucky enough to be to have operated in the black here, yeah. though not glowingly, but in the black. Uh, but it, it certainly helps with the other hospitals. But those were largely administrative things that didn't touch the population. They weren't <coughs> aware, though some did start noting that bills were coming from Maine Health. Yeah. Um, uh, what about, what will it mean to us in terms of improved services under unification? Uh, not that we couldn't go to Maine Med. We all did if we had something. You know, larger surgery, a specialized need, we were at Maine Med, but what will, what will unification mean to, uh, to quality of service here in so our community? It, it's a great question, um, and, and you moderated at least two forums that I know of in this community when we were talking about unification last year and the year before. And you know, as we went through unification, it's clear that if there's a third rail 
in healthcare that you don't touch, that you know, if you put your hands on it, be ready for a shock. It's having a conversation with a community and talking about services, but more importantly, who is going to decide which services are provided mm -hmm. in healthcare in my community? And so you, you would have the same discussion if you were trying to consolidate school districts, if you're trying to, uh, for, you know, God forbid, ever consolidate the University of Maine system, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Anytime you deal with a consolidation or centralization activity, the issue is what local control, what does local control mean in that discussion? So mm -hmm. it's a, the third rail is a local control issue, and uh, we're Mainers, we, we, oh. we, we're big on local control, okay. and justifiably so. And so when we, when we began the conversations about unification, it really quickly started with a conversation about, well, who's, who's gonna make decisions around mm -hmm. what services are in the community? Now, the trade-off there is that without unification, what we were seeing in some of our rural communities was that when the board started to struggle um, financially, they began to reduce or eliminate services that we believe belong locally. We, we, we start this whole discussion by I developing think. care models, which say, how are we gonna provide care in every community? And there is basic care that we believe needs to be in every community. There's secondary care, these are terms that healthcare people use, but there's secondary levels of care that we believe belong in every community, not every day, not 24 seven, but they need to be in a community. And then there's tertiary care that belongs at Maine Medical Center in our example. Tertiary care is easy. We, our community hospitals are never gonna do tertiary care, but the challenge becomes how do you support the basic primary care ambul in ambulatory settings? How do you uh, support the, some of the secondary care, the, the urologic care that belongs, the cardiovascular, cardiology care mm -hmm. that belongs in every community, dermatology that belongs in every community, ENT. Uh, oncology, ENT. Those are all services that are, mm -hmm. that are being threatened in rural Maine uh, because we don't have the scale or we, we have diminishing volumes or deteriorating financial results. Um, and so the question is how do you as a system keep those services in play? In the state of Maine, if you, if you asked me to pick the one service that is under threat right now in the state of Maine, in rural Maine, it is OB, OBGYN. Okay. Wow, we are I seeing, would have thought urology. <laughs> yeah, we, are, we are seeing incredible pressure up north with, because volumes are dropping. And you know there is a level where if a hospital is not providing a certain level of births, you, you, start, to access, you start to impact quality. You start to impact the ability of the nursing staff and others to maintain their competencies to provide the number of births that, they, that they're doing. And so we've seen at least two communities in northern Maine recently uh, drop OB services. The problem is when you start dropping, well, st dropping deliveries. What happens is when you drop deliveries, you then start impacting pre and p prenatal and postnatal, postnatal care. Yeah. And so it's, you know, there's, we have an example now where you know, uh, mothers are traveling in excess of an hour to deliver babies. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can, you can put in transportation systems, you can put in systems that, that help that and, and make that possible. But when you have to travel an hour, an hour and 15 minutes for pre and postnatal mm -hmm. care, that is tough. And in January. In, in there, there was in, an yeah. article, wasn't there an article in the Press Herald about that recently, there about was. some of the we, northern <coughs> communities and the, the length of time that people had to travel. Um, the, it would seem, and I know at least this is what we're talking about uh, with our, our new building on campus, that's allowing us to bring in more specialists to serve. Uh, we, we already had an ENT who was outstanding, uh, who spent time down here, but we're looking to have other specialties that can come now that we have some additional available office space. Will that be the trend in unification to allow us to share the competencies between hospitals, I don't know if competencies is the right word, but you know what I mean, yeah, specialties. Yeah, the specialties, yeah. yeah. No, it, it absolutely is the trend. I, you know, the, uh, the, the great thing about the Watson Center is that gave Lincoln Health the facilities to do it. Uh, you know, we, we don't in every one of our communities have the facilities where a specialist from Portland or a specialist from somewhere else can rotate into the community and have a clinic either an afternoon a week or, you know, two a week, 
three times a month, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so what that project did at Lincoln was it, it gave space so that people can rotate in from other areas and it's going to broaden the specialty care that's really? available. That exci it excites me as a trustee and it, I, it excites all of us, I think, that we're going to be allowed to do that. I mean, it's pretty hard to attract people if they're working in the equivalent of Andy's old coat closet that he used to practice out of <laughs> as a pediatrician. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, you, uh, you know your, your brethren to the north, uh, the next local health system in our system north of here uh, is Coastal, and, you know, which Coastal Healthcare Alliance, which is in Rockland and, and in, in Belfast. And just, I think it was yesterday, the day before, they did a groundbreaking yeah. for a health center. Yeah. Now it's, uh, as you know, Mark Foray, who was one of yours and is now up there as the CEO, he liked the concept of the, the Watson Health Center, and uh, <laughs> we're trying to replicate it. So to your point, we are trying to put in place facilities around our entire system, similar to the Watson Center, where you know, uh, subspecialty pediatricians, urologists, medical oncologists, uh, cardiologists, they can all rotate into communities so that people can get care, appropriate care, as close to home as possible. Okay. And so we're, we're doing the same thing, and uh, if you get into Western Maine, we're now we're trying to we have we have a problem there in terms of orthopedic coverage, and we're we're trying to work with models where we rotate in from Portland from a group that's strong in orthopedics. We rotate someone into the community because we're struggling to get certain specialties into rural communities because we don't have the the volume or the scale to support that th that specialty. the The problem with specialty care is, as you know. You can't put a specialist in a rural community and expect he or she to practice medicine there on their own. You have things mm -hmm. called call coverage. Who's going to support me when I'm on vacation? Who's going to take care of my patients when, when, I'm, you know, when I'm home sleeping? Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. And you look at call coverage models and in specialty care, it means you have to have three of everything. Mm -hmm. And so when you get into a small community and you want to put orthopedics yeah. in yeah. there, if, it, if you are trying to do it based in the community, it's not one orthopod you need, it's three. And you can't afford, the, the, the volume's not there for three, so that there's enough volume to support the care, there's not enough volume to support the call coverage that supports that provider. No, even the cost. It, of and the co well, that's the, that's the issue, yeah. is the cost then fire out whelms, it, overwhelms it. I can't help but think, um, Sometimes I, I grumble about it. that's a personal thing. I mean, we are sharing even our administrative resources. I mean, yeah. we're Cindy Wade is working now yeah. up at Coastal. Some Bridget Miller's <coughs> working some up at Coastal. So we're beginning to to share uh, expertise, even administratively, yes. uh, yeah. organizationally, and that's that's um, uh, that's a good thing too, uh, I suppose. But um, another big change uh, is um, and. You'll you'll fill in the blanks, but I know our ambulances are now equipped, unbelievably, with connections right into Maine Med when yep. we're in transport. Uh, I know our hospital league uh, helped fund some units for the Waldo ambulance service, Wal Waldoboro ambulance service. That's irrelevant, but uh, it's amazing when we're using transport from here to go to Maine yep, Med. What is. can take place? Say it better than I just did. <laughs> well, that's, I'm not I'm not a clinician, so I got. I'll do my best. You'll do but, better than me. But, but I, you know, I, I will tell you, we have a phenomenal EMS service in the state of Maine. Uh, they're, 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 we always can use more resources, but the people that uh, run those services are just phenomenal. And Unbelievable. we, we should, we should uh, as, as citizens, we should really appreciate everything they do uh, based on the level of training they have and the effort they put into it. But to your point, the, the technology that has evolved has also impacted you know, EMS services and emergency services across the state. Uh, to, exactly to your point, today if someone is, is put in the back of a, an ambulance and is, it is being sent to Portland and it's a cardiac event, that they, they are getting an EKG in the truck, in the ambulance, That's and amazing. so everybody, and they are in communication with a physician down in Portland, the receiving hospital, they are looking at what's happening with that key EKG, et cetera, and they can actually activate the cath lab at Maine Medical Center, meaning that they can, in the back of that truck or the back of that ambulance, keep calling it a truck because yeah. it is well, a truck they are, frame. Yeah. They are truck <laughs> frames. Uh, but that, that those folks have the skills 
to say to, to an organization like Maine Medical Center, you need to activate the lab, which means you need to get the resources because people aren't sitting in a cath lab waiting for emergency caths. Yeah, yeah. So you have to bring them to the table. And so that means that that lab is ready and ready to go when that patient arrives. That wow. didn't happen years ago. That's a, that's a function of additional competencies and training in our EMS um, um, resource. And it's a, it's a change in communications yeah. and technology. Yeah. Like training is such an <coughs> important factor. We're seeing that in so many things, even, even in the local volunteer fire departments, the amount of training that's required. And these ambulance <laughs> services are astonishing. And they are so dedicated. I'm going to put in a plug for Central Lincoln County. They're getting ready to launch a <laughs> capital campaign. They need a new ambulance. So hear that, everyone. You just heard it from, from the big cheese, uh, how important these ambulances are. And they do amazing work. And some of the local jurisdictions, uh, and again, I know a little bit, which is dangerous, uh, are actually making wellness visits to homes. They, they are. There is a um there's a mo we, well, it starts with we have an access problem of primary care around the country in rural settings, and um, which means that we can't get patients into primary care practices, or patients can't travel to primary care practices. Mm -hmm. So we have transportation issues mm -hmm. in in rural settings, and so uh, there's this movement about that says, look, we have trained personnel. Uh, in many cases, they're sitting waiting for an emergency. Why can't those trained personnel go out and provide primary care to folks that might be homebound, yeah. et cetera? I think it's a tremendous use of a resource. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah so they, um, they, see how fast this goes? Oh, <laughs> it's amazing. It's really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, I really love that idea. I, I, um, uh, they are st checking on seniors who have they mobility are. problems without transportation. It, it's amazing, and I think it's a wonderful personal touch. And our small rural communities are nothing but personal touch. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So to that end, I'll get my last little plug. Uh, promise us that um, <clears throat> the Lincoln Health that we know and love will remain the the local hospital that still makes you feel like you're well cared for and, and uh, everyone wants you to get better when you walk through the door because that's just how they make us feel here. You know, I, I can't promise you that <laughs> Lincoln Health will be exactly the way it is today uh -huh. because healthcare is going to continue to evolve to yeah. and we're going to have to continue to evolve as healthcare evolves. What I can promise you is that our system has a commitment to providing quality care as close to home as possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you have a great community hospital in this area. We do. In, in I'm so area. proud so of our you, hospital. You, you, should, you should be extremely proud. A high quality organization, well run, well governed by you and other board members. And so you have a great community asset. And you know, I, I don't expect that's going to change going forward. Um, community hospitals, uh, as we've talked about in the past, have their own personality. They have oh, their own culture. Have, you yeah. can use the word culture. Absolutely. And, and they are, uh, one of their strengths is they are close to the people that are in the community. Absolutely. And that's a function of size. You know, I, um, the people, I, I live in the greater Portland area, and I, Maine Medical Center is my, my community hospital. Yeah. It also happens to be a very large tertiary hospital, et cetera. And Lord, so it can get to, take they, you 20 yeah. minutes to get where you're going. Well, yeah, <laughs> and, and, but, but, and so, you know, that's one of the benefits of being in a rural community is when you have a hospital like Lincoln um, and you go there, people know who you are. Yeah. And, and they, they, oh, they truly, yeah. you know, they know you, they know your family, they have a personal investment mm -hmm. in you yeah. that's a little bit different in a larger setting. And so, Well, coming from an urban area, I remember the day my husband laid in the hallway with a kidney stone arriving at 7 a.m. and saw a doctor at 5 p.m. You know, urban areas are a whole yeah. different kettle of fish. And by the way, let me not fail to mention that you all have a capital campaign underway. Uh, you'll be expanding. We'd, yeah, we'll uh, tell us a little bit about it. We just had a couple of very generous donations, one from our own Paul Colomb here uh, from Booth Bay. Uh, <coughs> so tell us about the capital campaign briefly as we wind down, but let, okay. let me let you do a plug for it now. <laughs> I didn't know I was up here plugging the campaign. But, um, I've given you the chance. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, you know, Maine Medical Center, is the, the organization you're talking about, has a, a very large project. It's, it's $534 million that they've embarked upon. And it's a, it's a combination of several smaller projects, but it's really about creating additional private room capacity at the medical center. 
It's about rebuilding and expanding a, an employee parking garage that um, you know, we, we, we sometimes forget that you need to provide parking for large organizations you don't like that. And have to remind that. us. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you have your issues on a, on a, a smaller scale, but um, it's also about uh, creating a, a six uh, story tower on Congress Street that, wow. that will have 19 more procedure rooms and things. Wow. And so it's really, it's, it, it, what it reflects is the fact that Maine Medical Center is a very busy place, and we see it as being a very busy place. You know, we talked about it earlier. Technology is forcing mm -hmm. certain procedures into larger organizations, and Maine Medical Center is our go-to place. Well, and so always one of the top-rated hospitals in the country. It is. So. It's absolutely. It's a well, gem that we have. Unfortunately, our time is up. I okay. cannot thank you enough for your time from your busy well, schedule. I enjoyed it. And I thank you all for joining us. I certainly learned something uh, more, and I hope you did as well. Thanks very much. Good night. I hope you enjoyed our interview with uh, Bill Karen. Next up, we'll be speaking with Jim Donovan, who's the president of Lincoln Health. Uh, it's a fascinating interview. He's assembled an extraordinary team in face of the COVID-19 virus and its effect on our hospital system. It was an enlightening interview, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to Community Conversations. Uh, my name is Marvin Nesbitt, and I'm your host. Um, I am so very grateful uh, to have as uh, our guest this evening, um, um, my friend, I, that's very bold to say, but my colleague, <laughs> uh, Jim Donovan, who's the CEO of Lincoln Health. Um, this has been an incredible time at Lincoln Health, and thank you and everyone on staff for the time you've taken to keep us up to date. We're glued. I get uh, emails from friends on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday saying, when, when will it be up? When will today's be up? We had a delay one day and you would have thought the sky had fallen mm -hmm. <laughs> in getting the interview up. <clears throat> it's been um, so comforting to uh, everyone, I think. It certainly has been to me. Um, uh, we have a deluge of scary information coming to yeah. us from all sides, so hearing it from those we know uh, is uh, is uh, extremely comforting. So thank you from all of us here at LCTV and from our whole community. Um, I deeply appreciate it. Um, uh, Dom, we've heard all the facts. I, I have to ask you, how are you? Oh. Holy moly, the CEO of a small rural hospital, a lovely one, um, uh, you know, I bet you didn't plan on this when you were in graduate school. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That, that, that is an understatement. First of all, I'm happy to be here, so thank you for the invitation, my friend. Um, no, this is, this is something that um, the word that gets thrown around all the time is unprecedented, yeah. and it's true. Uh -huh. Unless you were around in 1918, <laughs> which I wasn't, um, you, you've not dealt with anything like this before. Yeah. And it's something that um, it takes a great team, which we have oh. at, at Lincoln Health, and the clinicians, um, the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, the pharmacists, the lab people, the radiology people, et cetera. They're the ones on the front line. Absolutely. They are the tip of the spear. And um, I'm just so proud of them and what they are doing and how they're doing it uh, in responding to this, to this unprecedented crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where every day is a new adventure. It is. Yeah, we don't have the answers. We were talking before we yeah. went on about how carefully scientists are studying right. as right. we go right. to try to figure out just what's happening and how we can approach this. Um, you know, initially, uh, the focus seemed to be on um, older, pop the older right. members of our population, right. which of course scared me for this community. Yep. But now we're finding that's not necessarily the case. No, they're, they're learning something all the time yeah. about um, the, the virus, um, which groups it may affect more and, and, and why. But it, it's, it, like you say, it's something different every day. And that's the way science is when they have the, the word novel in front of the virus is just what this is. It's yeah. novel. It's, it's new. Um, so the scientists all around the world are trying to figure it out, trying to find um, 
medicines that will help try and ultimately try and find a vaccine um, to protect us against it, much like the seasonal flu vaccine yeah. it, it helps us. Um, there's lots of scientists out there right now trying to find a vaccine for coronavirus. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> my husband was a research bio a virologist. Where is he now when we need him? Uh, <laughs> but having read lots of his papers over the years, um, you know, one of the concerns, we have a different flu vaccine every year because right. the virus mutates. Right. That's my horror, and yeah. I'm not hearing uh, a lot of talk about this potential for mutation. We're hoping that the warmer weather will, you know, whatever. But um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's all very frightening. Um, yeah, it is. Many times prior to now, I've uh, complimented you on the leadership team we have at Lincoln Health. You have assembled an amazing collection of talented, smart, and dedicated people. Thank you. Um, how are they holding up in all this? They are the front line. You said it. But I worry about, you know, many of them I consider my friend. I worry yeah. about them yeah. enormously. Uh, uh, how are they doing? They're, they're doing very well. They're, they're pros. They really are. Um, th this, is, this is unique in that when, when we um, go through an, an emergency situation or a disaster, um, we have this process, this, this structure that we use called the Hospital Incident Command Structure. And it's something that's used by agencies all across the country. It's, it's common. Um, and in all the years that I could remember, and, and the Hicks has been around for a long time, it's been changed quite a bit, but it's been around a long time, um, I cannot remember having the uh, structure in place to, to tackle a problem or an issue that lasted more than 24 hours. Wow. Um, and it, they're usually things like uh, weather-related incidents, which you might call the group together. And, and the whole reason you, you, you use the HIC system is because you need more resources. Whether it's people, supplies, equipment, you need more resources to tackle the problem at that time. Um, so a severe weather, weather system might cause that. A fire. Uh, a fire. Yeah, remember when um, we had one at Chase Point. Yes. And fire. I remember your staff being yeah. there in the middle of the night. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> yeah, I remember um, that well. Yeah, you know, auto, you know, bus accidents, um, things like that. I will tell you, um, I worked at Maine Medical Center for a number of years, and when I was taking <clears throat> administrative call at Maine Medical Center, my worst fear was getting a call about a bus, a bus accident with kids. Oh, I can't remember. I got one once. Oh. I, I, I remember I was out running on a Saturday morning, and the beeper went off. And I called in. I actually had the phone with me. I called. This is before cell phones. It was that, that long ago. I, I called in, and they told me that this was in the summer. Uh, a busload of campers, the bus had overturned somewhere up around Naples or something or in the, in the Lakes region. And I froze and immediately called into the emergency department at, at Maine Medical Center to, to see what they knew. It, fortunately, it turned out to be relatively um, um, minor injuries. Uh, for the for the kids, but just that when I, you hear bus act, school bus accident, mm. um, but that might have been the most serious time um, I've ever seen, the most serious incident for which I've ever seen the Hicks system put in place. Um, but that lasted hours. Yeah. Um, there's been some others that have lasted maybe 24 hours. Right now, we're on day 20 yeah. of having our system in place. And um, it's brought the rest of our business pretty much to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. This is what we're focused on right now. This is what's important. This is where we're putting our resources. And uh, we will continue to do that for as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, <clears throat> I have to think. And trust me, my my primary concern in the universe is the health and well-being of everyone. But look at the implications for our society and even for our hospital. It's those other services that we provide that right. pay the bills. 
That's right. And um, so, you know, the implication of all of this, um, the wear and tear on our staff, right. the wear and tear on our finances, right. I, I think we can only begin to imagine now uh, what this will mean six months from now. God willing that this is passed right. six months from now, right. um, the actual recovery of our population. I mean, how long before we feel comfortable going into a restaurant again, even when they reopen? Yeah. I was listening to a, a fancy restaurateur in New York City being interviewed this morning and, you know, talking about the, their <clears throat> considering further spacing tables. Well, that's not going to pay the bills Most when people. you don't have as many. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I think we, while we're trying to imagine the implications uh, for the future, yeah, we, we it's a tip of the iceberg. It is in terms is. of what this means. Yeah, yeah, we're we're trying to understand. That. Obviously, we're focused on taking care of patients and being prepared for a surge, which, you know, is going to come as if the models are right, which they probably are. Mid April. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mid. We got a couple weeks before yeah. we we get hit. Um, but we've, you know, we've canceled basically everything elective, surgeries, appointments, everything elective for patients, um, and um, um, that includes laboratory testing, radiology, all, and like you said, that's the stuff that pays the bills, and it's, those bills are just, not, you know, they're stacking up right now for us. Sure, sure. Um, our finance people um, are um, also focused on the, the here and now, but they're also trying to figure out how we how we quantify this, how we, how we understand what the numbers are that that that, that are um, going to drive our, our our near future. Mm -hmm. It's across our main health system. We believe it's somewhere in the in the. Um, $80 million a month range. Um, and I think for Lincoln Health, it's probably um, in the, you know, five to six million dollars a month range. And, uh, and um, we didn't have five to six we don't, no, million no, dollars we, no, a month. Not, not even close. <laughs> not even close. Um, yeah, so we have, that's, we'll, we'll take care of that later. Sure. That, that's, Absolutely. Not, that's not the now, that's the down the road. But it's something we're, we really are thinking about. Yeah. Um, I think this is going this this kind of international um, virus and epidemic uh, pandemic is going to change the face of a lot of communities permanently. Yes. Um, whether yeah. it's like I said, restaurant business or the healthcare business, or any business, um, it's it's going to change things permanently. And again, we don't know what that looks like or what that will be, um, but. It, it's just it just has to be yeah things, things will change and that's not just us mm -hmm. it's my understanding that system-wide elective surgeries are being yes. postponed and deferred yeah. I even heard the rumor that um, there's consideration to postponing uh, chemo for cancer patients because of the effect mm -hmm. on the immune system that was just a rumor yeah. I'm not yeah. I don't know what yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> I, I, I've, not, I've not heard and, that um, I wouldn't be surprised yeah it wouldn't be yeah. Uh, yeah. a surprise at all no. you know we're all no. being so uh, careful and I do admire that I, that's another thought even in our community my personal observations have been uh, people being, being very careful in the Hannaford, that's really the only place other than here that I've been leaving yes, my house for. Yes. People are um, yeah. watching and respecting social distance and they instituted new line strategies at the Hannaford and they have the right. marked on the floor yeah, where yeah, you need yeah, to stand yeah, yeah, and yeah. shields for the mm -hmm. cashiers and I, yeah, I've seen that. I felt very uh, callous after I did it the other day. I commented to my favorite uh, cashier and uh, I said, you know, I'm only coming out when I have to and otherwise I'm sitting in my house and she said, oh geez, I wish I, I wish that was me and I thought, oh Marla, what an obtuse <laughs> jerk you are to have said that. Yeah. You know, they have to be scared. They it's are, it's our medical people who are the front line, yeah. but it's every shelf stocker in Walmart and shelf stocker in Hannaford and yes. cashier at Hannaford, yes. they're the front line too. They are. Uh, they are absolutely the front line, and, and you can you can see that there have been a number of um, grocery store employees around the state that have tested COVID positive, uh. um, just like there are a number of healthcare um, folks. So yeah, they are they are very much anybody who's interacting with with the public. So pharmacy is another good example. 
all the people who work in, in the pharmacies are right out there as well. Um, and uh, every day they go to work, it's, it, there, there's a risk involved. Yeah. And yet you see interview after interview with people saying it's my responsibility to help. It's my skill. It's what I do. Exactly. And I, whew, boy, yeah. uh, brave where our, our folks are. They are. Are brave. They are. Um, we are seeing an increase, and I can't help but address it. Not mm -hmm. that you're any expert on it. Mm -hmm. Our governor has. Mm -hmm. I'm told we have electronic signs about people who are coming into the state. Uh, from other states that are more greatly affected. I stood in the Hannaford parking lot the other day and and I pay attention as I drive down the highway and you are seeing Florida, Connecticut, New York, yep. New Jersey. Yep. Um, uh, we had reports of a confrontation in a parking lot in another town um, between a Mainer and someone with an out-of-state plate. Um, uh, You've been encouraging, I assume, here in town that folks who come in to please quarantine for a bit, as the governor has. I believe you addressed that in one of your uh, interviews on TV, if yeah. I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Um, that's that's so important for all of our well-being. You know, yeah. we're we've been so fortunate to have only five cases until yesterday, here in Lincoln County. Uh, we're now up to eight. 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 Um, so. Um, and again, at least what I heard projected on TV, mid-April we'll see uh, um, the peak of all this, let's hope, and then a yes. downturn from there. But yes. um, we encourage our visitors, we welcome you, of course, to your um, summer homes, but we hope that you'll exercise caution here when you come, uh, come into town. Maine Health has been an invaluable partner in all this, and mm -hmm. I know supplies, that's what we hear about all right. over the news. How are we equipped? And I know you've addressed that before, yep. but I also know it changes daily. It does change daily. Um, Absolutely. Does uh, change how daily. are we doing? I'm so impressed by businesses in Maine and how they've risen up to help. You know, it, it's, it's, been, it's been heartwarming uh, for me. Um, I've gotten calls from local business leaders. Um, members of my team have. Um, we've had people, you know, dropping off um, supplies um, that that we can use, particularly masks, uh, surgical masks, and, and what's called an N95 mask. People are probably hearing that, learned a new term. A lot of people, it's a the N95 mask is um, a mask that that uh, does not allow, um, but uh, doesn't allow uh, particles through. Uh, um, like other masks do, it's just more protective. Um, it's it's been wonderful. Um, people are people really understand uh, what's what's happening, and that it is a community wide effort um, to you know do the best we can to um, um, you know kind of mitigate the impact. So social distancing is absolutely proven and other countries have proven it, that we, we have to do that. Yeah. Um, washing our hands, um, all, all the things that you're hearing, that, that's, that's so important. And um, we've from, all learned how to sing happy birthday to you, right, happy birthday that, to you. <laughs> the happy birthday song, yeah. And, and you know, on, on the supplies, we, um, right, you're, as being part of, of Maine Health helps us in so many ways. But when it comes to supplies, um, it, not not just Maine Health is you know is, is very large, but then Maine Health for as long as I can remember has been attached to these absolutely huge nationwide purchasing organizations, the healthcare organizations, and through those organizations, um, we're we're in pretty good we're in pretty good shape right now. Uh, we've been able to put in place a, a masking protocol for all of our um, uh, teammates who have patient contact, resident contact in our nursing homes, or they are not able to work um, without being within six feet of a coworker. Um, we've now secured the masks across the main health system, and that's for 20 plus thousand employees um, in, in total, um, and other equipment as well. So th the work that um, uh, our, our supply chain folks are doing has, is, I think, the foundation of our response. Yeah. Um, you know, lately we've, we've brought in um, 
a bunch of, of scrubs, um, surgical scrubs for, for people to wear who are on the front lines, which that usually don't have to do that. Um, but it's just an extra step for us to take to, to make sure that, that our team members are, are as safe as we possibly can be. So gloves and face shields, and um, it, it's, it's just wonderful. We had a call today that I was listening to um, from Bowdoin College, and they're offering um, to make uh, face shields with 3D printers that they have. Wow. Um, so it, it just, it's just amazing. It is. Um, and it's going to keep up. I know it is. And we, we really appreciate it, and, and we, we can't do this without the full backing of our community. Well, and I hear our wonderful Brooks is 6 a.m. every morning. Oh, Brooks, <coughs> yeah, Brooks Betts, who's leading lo the logistics, logistics group yeah. and leading the, the supply chain. Yeah, I've, I've put a policy in place that he doesn't get to sleep until this thing is over. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, well, what, how wonderful. And Rotary. What Rotary did. Oh, oh my, goodness. my goodness. So uh, we're, we're going to have a lot of fun with this, but I'm so appreciative to the Newcastle Damerscott Rotary Club who um, challenged their members to go out and buy gift certificates to local restaurants and donate them. Um, and they chose as the recipient mm -hmm. of, of the donations um, Lincoln Health and um, you know, our EMS partners. And uh, I received the first 120 gift cards. These are $25 piece gift cards. I received the first 120 and um, I'm told that I can expect to receive upwards of another 300. Wow. So um, we put in place a, a, what we're calling the um, uh, Team Excellence Award, supported by the Damascata Newcastle Rotary Club, and we're now getting all kinds of uh, nominations in for that. Uh, this week, probably tomorrow or the day after, we'll announce our first uh, recipients of the award, um, and we'll keep doing that over the next several weeks. Uh, it's just it it, it shows. Um, the members of that club's um, understanding of what this it means to uh, the healthcare workers and and to the restaurant workers. Um, so we're, we're we're thrilled about it, and we will um, we will make sure that those gift cards um, get get put to good use when the restaurants are back up and running. Yeah, yeah that's another group I worry about. All my favorite servers yes. at my yes. favorite restaurants. Yes. Now, um, you know, every time you turn around, you think of somebody else you should be worrying about. But right. then we've long known the generosity of this community. I'm so very grateful yeah. to live in this community. We've seen it again well. and again. And, uh, uh, and again and again, we've seen it in Lincoln Health. So, yeah. um, well, I... Um, uh, <clears throat> oh, I, the one thing that had troubled me a little bit, knowing some of what we had uh, with uh, the whole St. Andrews situation. We've moved some staff from yes. Wiscasset and from St. Andrews to consolidate our professionals in one location. How right. has that been received? Uh, it's been, it's been received well. So yeah, the, 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 move, the moves that we've made have been to prepare for the, the surge mm -hmm. that, the, that we believe is coming. So um, the, first, the first thing we did um, is move the staff from the St. Andrews Urgent Care Center up to the Miles ED. Um, the, the Urgent Care Center volume is relatively low this time of the year, yeah. um, and it made sense for us to move those folks, the doctors, the nurses, the, the MAs, up, up to the Miles campus yeah. to, to support the emergency department. That's gone well. And doing that, we realize that the... Um, the, the hours that the urgent care center extended to 8 o'clock in the evening. So what we did, um, we extended the hours of our um, primary care practice down there the, called the Family Care Center ah. um, till 8 o'clock at night, and they're open now on weekends. So we, 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 we really replaced the hours. Yes. So the at, we didn't change the access. So people yeah. who live in the Booth Bay region have access to care Monday, Monday through Monday through Monday, seven days a week, um, from eight to eight. So the same Wonderful. hours, uh, and it's and a hundred yards away, yeah. uh, physically. Well, that's that's I'm sure very comforting. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. 
And you move my beloved PT people. We move the, we move the PT people. Uh, yes, yes. No, I think they're moving today. I think they're up and running today. Um, so the, the, the PT people, uh, PT, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, move from the, the Miles campus to the St. Andrews campus. Um, again, surge capacity. Where they are located on the Miles campus now, is, as, as some of the viewers may know, is on the third floor which is the old hospital floor. Yeah. So that the space that they are occupying on the, on the Miles campus now, we can quickly re, retool, if you will, uh, for patient um, inpatients should we need them during the surge. Yeah, yeah, so. <clears throat> yeah it's, it's amazing. Uh, every day is filled with change for you and decisions uh, for yeah. you all and yeah. those in the HIC. Well, I could do this all day, but I think we're drawing to an end. Um, but I, I, I have to close by again offering you our thanks as a community for um, all that Lincoln Health is doing to keep us safe. Um, I personally appreciate it deeply. I know all of our viewers do. And thank you so much for letting us come and talk to your staff members for little clips a few times a week. They've been yes. incredibly popular. I don't Good. know if Larry shared Good. some of the Good. viewing numbers with you, but it's, um, it's been overwhelming. So um, I can't thank you enough, and, and please give my thanks and best to all concerned. So thank you. Well, as, <clears throat> as, as I said earlier, it's, it's the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, the support staff on the front lines every day that are, are they're, they're, they're the heroes in this. Yeah. My job Never. is just to help them be able to do their job. To do their job, yes. Well, thank you. And thank you all uh, for uh, joining us. I appreciate your time and look forward to having you join us again. And uh, so thank you and good evening.